Hello, my name is Grant Hemby and welcome to my channel. This analysis is part of a continuing series looking at the piano etudes of Philip Glass. In this episode, I will be taking a deep dive into his etude number four. There are any number of ways to analyze a piece of music. Not inclusive to this list are formal analysis, stylistic analysis, sociocultural analysis, ethnomusicological analysis, historical or biographical analysis, or any one or more of them in combination and on and on. For this analysis, as for most of the glass analyses, I focus primarily on formal analysis, examining the musical structures of the piece. Originally, I was going to try to incorporate into the discussion about this etude some aspects of how it stands in relation to modernism and postmodernism, but I think that's too big a topic. That said, I may say something about that at the end. First, I want to talk about the general characteristics of this etude. It is one of the darkest of the etudes in mood. It is also one of the more dissonant etudes, perhaps the most dissonant in that he moves away from triads into various types of seventh and even ninth chords. There is also little melodic material or development, which is typical of minimalism in general. There is a focus on figuration as a driver of thematic development. Next, I want to talk about the textures in this piece. Textures are loaded onto the lower register of the piano giving the piece a darker mood. For example, the very beginning has an ostinato pattern in the left hand, outlining a first inversion B-flat major chord with an E-flat neighboring tone at the top. This is contrasted with a sustained D minor triad in first inversion in the right hand in the middle of the piano's register. Or is this a B-flat major seventh chord? Or maybe even a hint of bitonality? It's somewhat ambiguous. The ambiguity of key is one aspect of this piece. Regardless, the overall effect is serious, even brooding. This piece as a whole rarely strays from this texture, and the D minor triad in the right hand is a focal point of the piece, as is the D in general. I would say this piece is a piece in D. Let's talk about the chord structures. There's not really a strong sense of harmonic direction in a tonal sense, although he does use chord tension and relaxation as a tool. He uses static bass lines that are convincing, and how does Glass achieve this? Well, he does through, through rhythmic drive, which Glass, as well as other minimalists, are well known. Glass is also well known for his use of triads, yet here he employs seventh and even ninth chords pretty freely. There is more than a hint of jazz inspiration in this etude in that regard. Let's look at rehearsal number one through four, where he uses a variety of chords. B flat major seventh, C diminished chord with a flat 9, a G flat major 7th, which of course is a tritone from the C. Let's take a listen to these progressions. Let's look at rehearsal number 8 through 10. What key are we actually in? I don't think we're in any particular key here, actually. As we'll see in the figuration section, the line above could be an augmented Lydian scale in C flat, but there would clearly be some non scale tones in the harmony. The B flat dominant at the end is interesting insofar as the next chord returns to the opening chord. While some of Glass's harmony can be described using neo Romanian analysis, the limitations of that method are apparent here because mostly he's using seventh chords and neo-Romanian analysis really only extends towards triads. Let's talk about melody. Glass has some melody here, but there are less melodies than short motifs with stepwise motion. Let's hear a few examples.
let's talk about figurations. Glass uses scalar figurations as transitions, and to a limited degree as sections in and of themselves. Let's listen to one of these transition scalar figures. Now let's have a listen to the fully drawn out scales. Glass's use of inharmonic flats here doesn't make the task of determining what scale he is using easy. So I transpose the scale beginning on C4 and ordering according to standard numerical form so you can see the actual normal order of the scale. It looks kind of like an augmented Lydian scale to me. Now let's also talk about figurations with respect to the bass lines. He handles ostinato bass lines somewhat differently than we've seen thus far. In most of his works, it's kind of reworking of Alberti-inspired bass. The bass line here is basically the outline of an incomplete B-flat major chord with the E-flat at the top acting as a neighbor. Let's, let's take a listen to that again. Although I've talked about chords earlier, with the way the bass line is constructed, I don't think you necessarily hear a B flat major seventh in first inversion. I think what you're hearing is that D being drummed out in the bass, since that is your fundamental tone. And then with the D minor in the right hand, it basically gives the impression not of a B flat major seventh, but rather of a D minor with an extra chord tone. It's a very strange feeling because it does create a certain ambiguity in the ear, especially with the D minor chord in the right hand, setting the overall mood and tonal focal point. Let's take a listen to the bass line beginning at rehearsal number four and repeat it several times. This outlines alternatively a feel of a chordal harmony along with an E flat chord and a B flat minor seventh. Also, the rhythm crosses the bar line to create a kind of syncopation, especially with respect to what the right hand is doing. Let's take a listen to that. Conclusions. There is an ironic stance in this ATU that exemplifies its postmodern status. It almost sounds modernist, but clearly is not. It is ironic insofar as Glass builds up certain expectations that he has no real intention of fulfilling, or does so only partially. Its ambiguity in offering us a variety of theoretical interpretations without any being a true account qua true that holds up under objective standards of analysis is what makes this etude to my ears and eyes postmodern. In postmodernism, irony and ambiguity come together in a synthesis that defers meaning to a vanishing point. The coda of this etude exploits this fully. While the left hand continues the opening ostinato, the right hand crosses over to play a tricky trill on A flat that descends via chromatic triplet figure to D1, deep in the piano's register. It ends in a kind of inchoate place of nowhere as much postmodern thought takes us. On the other hand, Glass himself has said that these etudes ended up being more than he had intended them to be. They became autobiographical in a way that he did not foresee, so perhaps in these darker moments we are catching glimpses of Glass in a dark manic kind of mood. It's an interesting thought experiment. Thank you for joining me on this journey and watching my channel. If you would like to support my channel, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to take your support to another level, I also have a Substack newsletter I publish on a weekly basis, and I have a Kofi account. My Patreon account will also be published soon. Any support is greatly welcomed. Again, thank you for watching, and see you at the next.